The following is a letter from Jonathan Edwards to a Mr. Gillespie in answer to his objections to some things in the Treatise on the Religious Affections. It is dated Northampton, September 4th, 1747. Reverend and dear sir, I received your letter of November 24th, 1746, though very long after it was written. I thank you for it and for your offering me a correspondence with you. Such an offer I shall gladly embrace and esteem it a great privilege, more especially from the character I have received from you from Mr. Abercrombie, who I perceive was intimately acquainted with you. As to the objections you make against some things contained in my late book on religious affections, I am sorry you did not read the book through before you made them. If you had, perhaps the difficulties would not have appeared quite so great. As to what is contained in the 74th and 75th pages, I suppose there is not the least difference of opinion between you and me, unless it be concerning the signification and propriety of expressions. I am fully of your mind, and always was without the least doubt of it, that every one, both saint and sinner, is indispensably bound at all seasons by the divine authority to believe instantly on the Lord Jesus, and that the command of the Lord, 1 John 3.23, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, as it is a prescription of the moral law, no less binds the sinner to immediate performance than the commandment not to kill, to keep the Sabbath day, or any other duty, as to the present performance of which, in way of duty, all agree the sinner is bound, and that men are bound to trust the divine faithfulness, be their case with respect to light and darkness, sight and so on, what it will. Is that no situation they can be in looses them from obligation to glorify the Lord at all seasons, and expecting the fulfillment of his words, and that the sinner that is without spiritual light or sight is bound to believe, and that it is a duty at that very time incumbent on him to believe. But I conceive there is a great deal of difference between these two things, namely, it's being a man's duty that is without spiritual light or sight to believe, and it's being his duty to believe without spiritual light or sight, or to believe while he yet remains without spiritual light or sight. Just the same difference that is between these two things, namely, it's being his duty that has no faith to believe, and it's being his duty to believe without faith, or to believe without believing. I trust there is none will assert the latter, because of the contradiction that it implies. As it is not proper to say, it is a man's duty to believe without faith, because it implies a contradiction. So I think it equally improper to say it is a man's duty to believe without these things that are essentially implied in faith, because that also implies a contradiction. But a spiritual sight of Christ or knowledge of Christ is essentially implied in the very nature and notion of faith. And therefore it is absurd to talk of believing on Christ without spiritual light or sight. It is the duty of a man that is without these things, that essentially belong to faith, to believe. And it is the duty of a man that is without these things, that essentially belong to love, to love God, because it is an indispensable obligation that lies on all men at all times and in all circumstances to love God. But yet it is not a duty to love God without loving him or continuing without those things that essentially belong to his love. It is the duty of those that have no sense of the loveliness of God, and have no esteem of him to love him, and they be not in the least excused by the want of this sense and esteem, and not loving him one moment. But yet it would be nonsense to say it is their duty to love him without any sense of his loveliness or any esteem of him. It is indeed their duty this moment to come out of their disesteem and stupid, wicked insensibility of his loveliness, and to love him. I made the distinction, I thought very plainly, in the midst of those sentences you quote is exceptionable. I say expressly, page 74, It is truly the duty of those who are in darkness to come out of darkness into light and believe. 
but that they should confidently believe and trust while they yet remain without spiritual light or sight is an anti-scriptural and absurd doctrine. The misunderstanding between us, dear sir, I suppose to be in the different application of the particle without, and my use of it, and your understanding of it. Or what we understand is spoken of and supposed in the expression without spiritual light or sight. As I use it, I apply it to the act of believing, and I suppose it to be very absurd to talk of an act of faith without spiritual light and sight, wherein I suppose you will allow me to be in the right. As you understand it, it is applied to duty or obligation, and you suppose it to be not at all absurd to talk of an obligation to believe without spiritual light or sight, but that the obligation remains full where there is no spiritual light or sight. Wherein I allow you are in the right. I think, sir, if you read what I have said in my book on this head again, it will be exceeding apparent to you that it is thus that I apply the preposition without, and not as you before understood it. I thought I had very plainly manifested that what I meant by being in darkness was a being in spiritual blindness, and so in a dead, stupid, carnal, and unchristian frame and way and not what is commonly called a being without the light of God's countenance under the hidings of his face. We have a great number of people in these parts that go on that supposition in their notions and practice, that there really is such a thing as such a manner of believing, such a kind of faith as this, namely, a confident believing and firm trusting in God in the dark, in the sense mentioned, that is to be sought after, and is a subject matter of divine prescription, and which many actually have. And indeed there are innumerable instances of such as are apparently in a most senseless, careless, negligent, apostate, in every way unchristian and wicked frame, that yet encouraged by this principle retain an exceeding strong confidence of their good state, and count that herein they do their duty and give much glory to God under the notion of trusting God in the dark." and hoping against hope, and not trusting on their own righteousness. And they suppose it would show a legal spirit to do otherwise. I thought it would be manifest to every reader that I was arguing against such a sort of people. You say it merits consideration whether the believer should ever doubt of his state, on any account whatever, because doubting, as opposed to believing, is absolutely sinful. Here, sir, you seem to suppose that a person's doubting of his own good estate is a proper opposite of faith. And these and some other expressions in your letter seem to suppose that doubting of one's good estate and belief is the same thing. And so, that being confident of one's good estate and faith are the same thing. This I acknowledge I don't understand. I don't take faith in a person's believing that they have faith to be the same thing. Nor do I take unbelief or being without faith and doubting whether they have it to be the same thing, but entirely different. I should have been glad either that you had taken a little more notice of what I say on this head, pages 76 and 77, or that you had said something to convince me that I am wrong in this point. The exercise of faith is doubtless a way to be delivered from darkness, deadness, backsliding, and so on, or rather is a deliverance. As forsaken sin is a way to deliverance from sin, and is a deliverance itself. The exercise of grace is doubtless a way to deliverance from a graceless frame that consists in the want of exercise of grace. But as to what you say or seem to intimate of a person's being confident of his own good estate, as being the way to be delivered from darkness, deadness, backsliding, and prevailing iniquity, I think whoever supposes this to be God's method of delivering his saints, when sunk into an evil, careless, carnal, and unchristian frame, first to assure them of their good estate and his favor, while they yet remain in such a frame, and to make that the means of their deliverance, does surely mistake God's method of dealing with such persons. Among all the multitudes I have had opportunity to observe, I never knew one dealt with after this manner. I have known many brought back from great declension that appeared to me to be true saints, but it was in a way very diverse from this. In the first place, conscience has been awakened, and they have been brought into great fear of the wrath 
of God, having his favor hid, and they have been the subjects of a kind of new work of humiliation, brought to a great sense of their deserving of God's wrath, even while they have yet feared it, before God has delivered them from the apprehension of it, and comforted them with a renewed sense of his favor. As to what I say of the necessity of universal obedience, or of one way of known sin, i.e. so as properly to be said to be the way and manner of the man, be an exception enough against a man's salvation, I should have known better what to have said further about it, if you had briefly shown how the scriptures that I mention, and the arguments I deduce from them are insufficient for the proof of this point. I confess they appear to me to prove it as fully as anything concerning the necessary qualifications of a true saint can be proved from scripture. You object against my saying, page 276, quote, Nor can a true saint ever fall away, so that it shall come to this, that ordinarily there shall be no remarkable difference in his walk and behavior since his conversion from what was before, end quote. This, I think, implies no more than that his walk over the same ground, in like circumstances, under, under like trials, will have a remarkable difference. As to the instance you mention of David and Solomon, I don't know that the scripture gives us anywhere so much of a history of their walk and behavior before their conversion as to put us into any proper capacity of comparing their after walk with their former. These examples are uncertain, but I think those doctrines of the scripture are not uncertain, which I mention in the place you cite to confirm the point, which teach that converts are new men, new creatures, that they are renewed not only within but without, that old things are passed away and all things become new, that they walk in newness of life, that the members of their bodies are new, that whereas they before were the servants of sin and yielded their members servants of iniquity, now they yield themselves servants of righteousness unto holiness. As to those doubts and cases of difficulty you mention, I should think it very needless for a divine of your character to apply yourself to me for a solution of difficulties for whom it would be more proper to learn of you. However, since you are pleased to insist on my giving my mind upon them, I would observe, as to the first case you mention, of a person incessantly harassed by Satan and so on, you don't say of what nature the temptations are that he is harassed with. But I think it impossible to give proper advice and direction without knowing this. Satan is to be resisted in a very different manner in different kinds of onsets. When persons are harassed with those strange, horrid injections that melancholic persons are often subject to, he is to be resisted in a very different manner from what is proper in a case of violent temptation to gratify some worldly lust. In a former case, I should by no means advise a person to resist the devil by entering the lists with him and vehemently engage in their mind in an earnest dispute and violent struggle with a grand adversary, but rather by diverting the mind from his frightful suggestions, by going on steadfastly and diligently in the ordinary course of duty without allowing themselves time and leisure to attend to the devil's sophistry, or viewing his frightful representations, committing themselves to God by prayer in this way without anxiety about what has been suggested. That is the best way of resisting the devil that crosses his design most, and he more effectually disappoints him in such cases that treats him with neglect than he that attends so much to him as to engage in a direct conflict and goes about to try his strength and skill with him in a violent dispute or combat. The latter course rather gives him advantage than anything else, it is what he would if he can get persons thus engaged in a violent struggle. He gains a great point. He knows that melancholy persons are not fit for it. By this he gains that point of diverting and taking off the person from the ordinary course of duty, which is one great thing he aims at. And by this, having gained a person's attention to what he says, he has opportunity to use all his craft and subtlety and by the struggle he raises melancholy vapors to a greater degree and further weakens a person's mind and gets him faster and faster in his snares, deeper and deeper in the mire, 
He increases a person's anxiety of mind, which is the very thing by which mainly he fulfills all his purposes with such persons. Concerning the other difficulty you mentioned relating to the verifying of Romans 8 verse 28, all things shall work together for good and so on, in a saint that falls under backsliding and spiritual decays, it seems to be a matter of some difficulty to understand exactly how this is to be taken and how far it may from hence be inferred that the temptations the saints meet with from Satan and an evil world and their own declensions and sins shall surely work for their good. However, since you desire my thoughts, I would express them such as they are as follows. In order rightly to state this matter, there are two things that may be laid down as positions of certain and indubitable truth concerning this doctrine of the apostle first. The meaning cannot be that God's dispensations and disposals towards each saints are the best for him, most tending to his happiness, of all that are possible, or that all things that are ordered for him are done by God with respect to him are in all respects better for him than anything else that God could have ordered or done, issuing in the highest good and happiness, that it is possible he should be brought to you. For that would be as much as to say that God would bestow on every one of us the elect as much happiness as he can confer in the utmost exercise of his omnipotence, and this sets aside all these different degrees of grace and holiness here and glory hereafter, which he bestows according to his sovereign pleasure. All things may work together for good to the saints. All may be of benefit to them and may have a concurring tendency to their happiness. and may all finally issue in it and yet not tend to or issue in the highest degree of good and happiness possible. There is a certain measure of holiness and happiness that each one of the elect is eternally appointed to, and all things that relate to him work together to bring to pass this appointed measure of good. The text and context speak of God's eternal purpose of good to the elect, predestinating them to a conformity to his Son in holiness and happiness, and the implicit reasoning of the apostle leads us to suppose that all things will purely concur to bring to effect God's eternal purpose. And therefore, from his reasoning, it may be inferred that all things will tend to work together to bring to pass that degree of good that God has purposed to bestow upon them and not any more. And indeed, it would be in itself unreasonable to suppose anything else but this, inasmuch as God is the supreme orderer of all things. Doubtless all things shall be so ordered that with one consent they shall help to bring to pass his ends, aims, and purposes. But surely not to bring to pass what he does not aim at and never intended. God in his government of the world is carrying on his own designs and everything, but he is not carrying on that which is not his design, and therefore there is no need of supposing that all the circumstances, means, and advantages of every saint are the best in every respect that God could have ordered for him, or that there could have been no circumstances or means that he could have been the subject of, that would, with God's usual blessing, have issued in this greater good. Every saint is, as it were, a living stone, that in this present state of preparation is fitting for the place appointed for him in the heavenly temple, and in this sense all things undoubtedly work together for good to every one that is called according to God's purpose. He is all the while, he lives in this world, by all the dispensations of providence towards him, fitting for the particular mansion and glory that is appointed and prepared for him, or hewing for his appointed place in the heavenly building. Secondly, another thing which is no less certain and demonstrable than the position that has been already laid down, and indeed follows from it, is this. When it is said all things work together for good, and hereby cannot be intended that all things, both positive and negative, are best for them, or that it is so universally that not only every positive thing that the saints are the subjects of, or are concerned in, will work for their good, but also that when anything is absent or withheld from them by God and his providence, that absence or withholding is also for their good in that sense, or to be better for them than the presence or bestowment would have been, for this would have the same absurd consequence that was mentioned before, namely, that God makes every saint as happy as possibly he can, and besides, if so, it would follow that God's withholding greater degrees of the sanctifying influences of his spirit is for the saints' good, and that it is best for them to live and die so low in grace as they do, 
which would be as much as to say that it is for their good to have no more good, or that is for their happiness to have no more happiness here and hereafter, if we take good notice of the Apostle's discourse in Romans 8. It will be apparent that his words imply no such thing. All God's creatures and all that God does in disposing of them is for the good of the saint. But it will not thence follow that all God's forbearing to do is also for his good, or that it is best for him that God does no more for him. The following reading from Jonathan Edwards is from Thoughts on the Present Revival of Religion. If we look back into the history of the Church of God in past ages, we may observe that it has been a common device of the devil to overset a revival of religion when he finds he can keep men quiet and secure no longer, then he drives them to excesses and extravagances. He holds them back as long as he can, but when he can do it no longer, then he will push them on and, if possible, run them upon their heads. And it has been by this means chiefly that he has been successful in several instances to overthrow most hopeful and promising beginnings. Yea, the principal means by which the devil was successful, by degrees, to overset the grand religious revival of the world in the primitive ages of Christianity, and in a manner to overthrow the Christian church through the earth, and to make way for the great anti-Christian apostasy, that masterpiece of all the devil's works was to improve the indiscreet zeal of Christians, to drive them into those three extremes of enthusiasm, superstition, and severity towards opposers which should be enough for an everlasting warning to the Christian church. Though the devil will do his diligence to stir up the open enemies of religion, yet he knows what is for his interest so well that, in a time of revival of religion, his main strength shall be tried with the friends of it, and he will chiefly exert himself in his attempts to mislead them. One truly zealous person, in a time of such an event, that seems to have had a great hand in the affair, and draws the eyes of many upon him, may do more, through Satan's being too subtle for him, to hinder the work, than a hundred great and strong and open opposers. In the time of the great work of Christ, his hands with which he works are often wounded in the house of his friends, and his work hindered chiefly by them, so that if any one inquires as in, What are those wounds in thine hands? He may answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. The heirs of the friends of the work of God, and especially of the great promoters of it, give vast advantage to the enemies of such a work. Indeed, there are many things which are no heirs, but are only duties faithfully and thoroughly done, that wound the minds of such persons more than real heirs. But yet one real heir gives opposers as much advantage, and hinders and clogs the work as much, as ten that are only supposed ones. Real errors do not fret and gall the enemies of religion so much as those things that are strictly right, but they encourage them more, they give them liberty and open a gap for them, so that some who before kept their enmity burning in their own breasts, and dared not show themselves, will on such an occasion take courage and give themselves vent, and their rage will be like that of an enemy let loose. Those who lay still before, having nothing to say but what they would be ashamed of, agreeable to Titus 2.8, when they have such a weapon put into their hands, will fight with all violence. And indeed the enemies of religion would not know what to do for weapons to fight with were it not for the heirs of its friends, and so must soon fall before them. Besides in real heirs, things that are truly disagreeable to the rule of God's word, we cannot expect the divine protection, and that God will appear on our side as if heirs were only supposed ones. Says therefore the ears of the friends and promoters of such a glorious work of God are of such dreadful consequence, and seeing the devil be insensible of this, is so assiduous, watchful, and subtle in his attempts with him, and has by this been so successful to overthrow religion heretofore, certainly such persons ought to be exceedingly circumspect and vigilant, diffident and jealous of themselves, and humbly dependent on the guidance of the Good Shepherd, First Peter four seven. Be sober, and watch into prayer. And First Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion walketh about. For persons to go on resolutely in a kind of heat and vehemence, despising admonition and correction, being confident that they must be in the right because they are full of the Spirit, is directly contrary to the import of these words, Be sober, 
be vigilant. It is a mistake I have observed in some, by which they have been greatly exposed to their wounding, that they think they are in no danger of going astray, or being misled by the devil, because they are near to God, and so have no jealous eye upon themselves, and neglect vigilance and circumspection as needless in their case. They say they do not think that God will leave them to dishonor him and wound religion as long as they keep near to him. And I believe so too as long as they keep near to God, so as to maintain a universal intelligent watch and care, to do their duty, avoid sin and snares with diffidence in themselves and humble dependence and prayerfulness, but not merely because they are receiving blessed communications from God, and refreshing views of him, if at the same time they let down their watch and are not jealous over their own hearts, by reason of its remaining blindness and corruption, and a subtle adversary. The following is taken from the Freedom of the Will by Jonathan Edwards, and it deals with the sincerity of desires, showing that in the unregenerate they come from mercenary motives. That sincerity of desires and endeavors which is supposed to excuse in the non-performance of things in themselves good, particularly considered. It is much insisted on by many that some men, though they are not able to perform spiritual duties, such as repentance of sin, love to God, a cordial acceptance of Christ as exhibited and offered in the gospel, and so on, yet may be sincere in their desires and endeavor after these things, and therefore must be excused, it being unreasonable to blame them for the omission of those things, which they sincerely desire and endeavor to do, but cannot. Concerning this matter, the following things may be observed. Number one, what is here supposed is a great mistake and gross absurdity, even that men may sincerely choose and desire those spiritual duties of love, acceptance, choice, rejection, and so on, consisting in the exercise of the will itself, or in the disposition and inclination of the heart, and yet not able to perform or exert them. This is absurd because it is absurd to suppose that a man should directly, properly, and sincerely incline to have an inclination which at the same time is contrary to his inclination. For that is to suppose him not to be inclined to that which he is inclined to. If a man in a state and acts of his will, in inclination, properly and directly falls in with those duties, he therein performs them, for the duties themselves consist in that very thing, they consist in the state and acts of the will being so formed and directed. If the soul properly and sincerely falls in with a certain proposed act of will or choice, the soul therein makes that choice its own. Even as when a moving body falls in with the proposed direction of its motion, that is the same thing as to move in that direction. Number two, that which is called a desire and willingness for those inward duties, and such as do not perform them, has respect to these duties only indirectly and remotely, and is improperly so called, not only because, as was observed before, it respects those good volitions only in a distant view, and with respect to future time, but also because evermore, not these things themselves, but something else that is foreign, is the object that terminates these volitions and desires. A drunkard who continues in his drunkenness, being under the power of a violent appetite to strong drink, and without any love to virtue, but being also extremely covetous and close, and very much exercised and grieved at the diminution of his estate and prospect of poverty, may in a sort desire the virtue of temperance, and though his present will is to gratify his extravagant appetite, yet he may wish he had a heart to forbear future acts of intemperance, and forsake his excesses, through an unwillingness to part with his money, but still he goes on with his drunkenness, his wishes and endeavors are insufficient and ineffectual. Such a man has no proper, direct, sincere willingness to forsake this vice, and the vicious deeds which belong to it, for he acts voluntarily in continuing to drink to excess. His desire is very improperly called a willingness to be temperate. It is no true desire of that virtue, for it is not that virtue that terminates his wishes, nor have they any direct respect at all to it. 
It is only the saving of his money or the avoiding of poverty that terminates and exhausts the whole strength of his desire. The virtue of temperance is regarded only very indirectly and improperly, even as a necessary means of gratifying the vice of covetousness. So a man of an exceedingly corrupt and wicked heart who has no love to God and Jesus Christ, but on the contrary, being very profane and carnally inclined, has the greatest distaste of the things of religion and enmity against them, yet being of a family that from one generation to another have most of them died in youth of an hereditary consumption, and so having little hope of living long, and having been instructed in the necessity of a supreme love to Christ, and latitude for his death and sufferings, in order to his salvation from eternal misery, if under these circumstances he should, through fear of eternal torments, wish he had such a disposition, but his profane and carnal heart remaining, he continues still in his habitual distaste of, in enmity to God and religion, and wholly without any exercise of that love and gratitude, is doubtless the very devils themselves, notwithstanding all their devilishness of their temper, would wish for a holy heart if by that means they could get out of hell. In this case, there is no sincere willingness to love Christ and choose him as his chief good. These holy dispositions and exercises are not at all the direct object of the will. They truly share no part of the inclination or desire of the soul, but all is terminated on deliverance from torment. And these graces and pious volitions, notwithstanding this forced consent, are looked upon as in themselves undesirable, as when a sick man desires a dose he greatly abhors in order to save his life. From the things it appears that this indirect willingness is not that exercise of the will which the command requires, but is entirely a different one, being a volition of a different nature, and terminated altogether on different objects, wholly falling short of that virtue of will to which the command has respect. This other volition, which has only some indirect concern with the duty required, cannot excuse for the lack of that good will itself which is commanded, being not the thing which answers and fulfills the command, and being wholly destitute of the virtue which the command seeks. Further, to illustrate this manner, if a child has a most excellent father that has ever treated him with fatherly kindness and tenderness, and has every way in the highest degree merited his love and dutiful regard, and is withal very wealthy, but the son is of so vile a disposition that he inveterately hates his dad, and yet apprehending that his hatred of him is like to prove his ruin, by bringing him finally to those abject circumstances which are exceedingly adverse to his avarice and ambition, he therefore wishes it were otherwise. But yet remaining under the invincible power of his vile and malignant disposition, he continues still in his settled hatred of his father." Now such a son's indirect willingness to love and honor his father at all acquits or excuses before God for his failing of actually exercising these dispositions towards him, which God requires, it must be on one of these accounts, number one, either that it answers and fulfills the command, but this is, does not by the supposition, because the thing commanded is love and honor to his worthy parent. If the command be proper and just as is supposed, then it obliges to the thing commanded, and so nothing else but that can answer the obligation. Or number two, it must be at least because there is that virtue or goodness in his indirect willingness that is equivalent to the virtue required, and so balances or countervails it and makes up for the want of it, but that also is contrary to the supposition. The willingness a son has merely from a regard to money and honor has no goodness in it, to countervail the lack of the pious filial respect required. Sincerity and reality in that indirect willingness, which has been spoken of, does not make it the better. That which is real and hearty is often called sincere, whether it be in virtue or vice. Some persons are sincerely bad, others are sincerely good, and others may be sincere and hearty in things which are in their own nature indifferent, as a man may be sincerely desirous of eating when he is hungry. But being sincere, hearty, and in good earnest is no virtue unless it be in a thing that is virtuous.
A man may be sincere and hearty and join in a crew of pirates or a gang of robbers. When the devils cried out and besought Christ not to torment them, it was no mere pretense. They were very hearty in their desires not to be tormented, but this did not make their will or desire virtuous. And if men have sincere desires which are in their kind and nature no better, it can be no excuse for the lack of any required virtue. And as a man's sincerity in such an indirect desire or willingness to do his duty, as has been mentioned, cannot excuse for the want of performance, so it is with endeavors arising from such a willingness. The endeavors can have no more goodness in them than the will of which they are the effect and expression. And therefore, however sincere and real, and however great a person's endeavors are, yea, though they should be to the utmost of his ability, unless the will from which they they proceed be truly good and virtuous, they can be of no avail or weight whatsoever in a moral respect. That which is not truly virtuous is, in God's sight, good for nothing, and so can be of no value or influence in his account to make up for any moral defect. For nothing can counterbalance evil but good. If evil be in one scale, and we put a great deal into the other of sincere and earnest desires, and many in great endeavors, yet if there be no real goodness at all, there is no weight in it, and so it does nothing towards balancing the real weight, which is in the opposite scale. It is only like subtracting a thousand knots from before a real number, which leaves a sum just as it was. Indeed, such endeavors may have a negatively good influence. Though things which have no positive virtue have no positive moral influence, yet they may be an occasion of persons avoiding some positive evils. As if a man were in the water with a neighbor to whom he had ill will, and who could not swim, holding him by his hand, this neighbor was much in debt to him. The man is tempted to let him sink and drown, but refuses to comply with the temptation, not from love to his neighbor, but from the love of money, and because by his drowning he should lose his debt. That which he does in preserving his neighbor from drowning is nothing good in the sight of God, yet by this he avoids the greater guilt that would have been contracted if he designedly let his neighbor sink and perish. But when Arminians in their disputes with Calvinists insist so much on sincere desires and endeavors, is what must excuse men, because accepted of God, and so on, it is manifest they have respect to some positive moral weight or influence of those desires and endeavors. Accepting, justifying, and excusing on the account of sincere endeavors, as they are called, and men doing what they can, and so on, has relation to some moral value, something that it accepts as good, and as such countervailing some defect. But there is a great and unknown deceit arising from the ambiguity of the phrase, sincere endeavors. Indeed, there is a vast indistinctness and unfixedness in most, or at least very many, of the terms used to express things pertaining to moral and spiritual matters, whence arise innumerable mistakes, strong prejudices, inextricable confusion, and endless controversy. The word sincere is most commonly used to signify something that is good. Men are habituated to understand by it the same as honest and upright, which terms excite an idea of something good in the strictest and highest sense, good in the sight of him who sees not only the outward appearance but the heart, and therefore men think that if a person be sincere he will certainly be accepted. If it be said that any one is sincere in his endeavors, this suggests that his heart is good, that there is no defect of duty as to virtuous inclination. He honestly and uprightly desires and endeavors to do as he is required, and this leads him to suppose that it would be very hard and unreasonable to punish him, only because he is unsuccessful in his endeavors. The thing endeavored after being beyond his power... Whereas it ought to be observed that the word sincere has these different significations. First, sincerity, as a word is sometimes used, signifies no more than reality of will and endeavor with respect to anything that is professed or pretended without any consideration of the nature of the principle or aim. Whence this real will and true endeavor arises. 
If a man has some real desire, either direct or indirect, to obtain a thing, or does really endeavor after it, he is said sincerely to desire or endeavor without any consideration of the goodness of the principle from which he acts, or any excellency or worthiness of the end for which he acts. Thus a man who is kind to his neighbor's wife, who is sick and languishing, and very helpful in her case, makes a show of desiring and endeavoring her restoration to health and vigor, and not only makes such a show, but there is a reality in his pretense, he does heartily and earnestly desire to have her health restored, and uses his true and utmost endeavors for it. He is said sincerely to desire and endeavor after it, because he does so truly or really, though perhaps the principle he acts from is no other than a vile and scandalous passion. Having lived in adultery with her, he earnestly desires to have her health and vigor restored, that he may return to his criminal pleasures." Or number two, by sincerity is meant not merely a reality of will and endeavor of some sort, and from some consideration or other, but a virtuous sincerity. That is, that in the performance of those particular acts, that are the manner of virtue or duty, there be not only the manner but the form and essence of virtue consisting in the aim that it governs the acts, and the principle exercised in it. There is not only the reality of the act, that is, as it were, the body of the duty, but also the soul, which should properly belong to such a body. In this sense, a man is said to be sincere when he acts with a pure intention, not from sinister views. He not only in reality desires and seeks the thing to be done, or qualification to be obtained for some end or other, but he wills the thing directly and properly, as neither forced nor bribed. The virtue of the thing is properly the object of the will. In a former sense, a man is said to be sincere in opposition to a mere pretense, and show of the particular thing to be done or exhibited without any real desire or endeavor at all. In a latter sense, a man is said to be sincere in opposition to that show of virtue there is in merely doing the manner of duty, without the reality of the virtue itself and the soul. A man may be sincere in the former sense, and yet in the latter be in the sight of God, who searches the heart of vile hypocrite. In the latter kind of sincerity only, there is anything truly valuable or acceptable in the sight of God. And this is what in scripture is called sincerity, uprightness, integrity, truth in the inward parts, and heirs of a perfect heart. And if there be such a sincerity and such a degree of it as there ought to be, and there be anything further that the man is not able to perform, or which does not prove to be connected with his sincere desires and endeavors, the man is wholly excused and acquitted in the sight of God. His will shall be surely accepted for his deed. And such a sincere will and endeavor is all that in strictness is required of him by any command of God. But as to the other kind of sincerity of desires and endeavors, having no virtue in it, as was observed before, it can be of no avail before God in any case to recommend, satisfy, or excuse, and has no positive moral weight or influence whatsoever. Application number one. Hence it may be inferred that nothing in the reason and nature of things appears from the consideration of any moral weight in the former kind of sincerity, leading us to suppose that God has made any positive promises of salvation, or grace, or any saving assistance, or any spiritual benefit whatsoever to any desires, prayers, endeavors, striving or obedience of those who hitherto have no true virtue or holiness in their hearts. Though we should suppose all the sincerity and the utmost degree of endeavor that is possible to be in any person without holiness. Some object against God requiring as a condition of salvation those holy exercises which are the result of a supernatural renovation, such as a supreme respect to Christ, love to God, loving holiness for its own sake, and so on, that these inward dispositions and exercises are above men's power, as they are by nature, and therefore that we may conclude that when men are brought to be sincere in their endeavors, and do as well as they can, they are accepted, and that this must be all that God requires in order to their being received as the objects of his favor, and must be what God has appointed as the condition of salvation." 
Concerning this, I would observe that in such manner of speaking as men being accepted because they are sincere and do as well as they can, there is evidently a supposition of some virtue, some degree of that which is truly good, though it does not go so far as were to be wished. For if men do what they can, unless their so doing be from some good principle, disposition, or exercise of heart, some virtuous inclination or act of the will, their so doing what they can is in some respect not a whit better than if they did nothing at all. In such a case there is no more positive moral goodness in a man doing what he can than in a windmill doing what it can because the action does no more proceed from virtue, and there is nothing in such sincerity of endeavor, or doing what we can that should render it any more a fit recommendation to positive favor and acceptance, or the condition of any reward or actual benefit, than doing nothing. For both the one and the other are alike nothing, as to any true moral weight or value. Application number two. Hence also it follows there is nothing that appears in the reason and nature of things which can justly lead us to determine that God will certainly give the necessary means of salvation or some way or other bestow true holiness and eternal life on those heathens who are sincere in the sense above explained and their endeavors to find out the will of the deity and to please him according to their light that they may escape his future displeasure and wrath and obtain happiness in the future state through his favor. End quote, from the freedom of the will on the inclination and sincerity of endeavors by Jonathan Edwards. Thank you for tuning in to the Puritan and Reformed audio podcast.